The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lord, uphold thou me that I might uplift thee. Amen. Just yesterday, some of us made our way out west in the morning for a graveside service at the Hollybrook Cemetery in Lincolnton. We were there to give thanks for the life of our friend Ted Mullen, whose presence here at St. Albans this past year was an unexpected and beautiful gift in our lives. I arrived about 25 minutes before the burial was scheduled to begin. And so I took a few moments just to quiet myself, absorb the, the beauty of the setting. The cemetery was draped in a thick blanket of fog. The trees, the bare trees, were only just visible through the silvery mist. It was gorgeous. And in the midst of that quiet loveliness, I just took a moment to hold Ted's memory in my heart, to pray for his sister Sue, and I found and felt a profound sense of peace in that holy place. I have a confession. I've always loved cemeteries. Even as a child, I never found them scary like some kids. Cemeteries have always been places where I have felt a sense of the holy, a sense of God's abiding presence with me. I think one of the things I find so meaningful in a cemetery is that you're surrounded by the names of people who you may not have known most of them, right? But, but who were once alive, like all of us are today, but who now rest with God. They were all different individuals with different stories, but now, in death, they all have something in common, right? Their earthly lives have ended, and any suffering they once knew is over for all time. I think when you're in a cemetery, you cannot help but be aware of the fleeting nature of this life. And to me, there is something very powerful about that. In that foggy cemetery yesterday, 
I felt it. I felt the sacredness of this holy mystery, which is endings and beginnings, right? And that great hope and promise of life everlasting. Today is the first Sunday of the season of Advent, and it is the first day of a new church year. And so it is an appropriate time to reflect on endings and beginnings. We're now beginning a new church year and a new three year, a new year in our three year lectionary cycle, which is the, the schedule of Bible readings that we hear each week in worship. We don't just pick them out of thin air. There's a calendar and we follow it. So last year, our Sundays were filled with um, Matthew's words from his gospel. Next year, it's gonna be Luke's turn. But this year, we're gonna get a nice healthy dose of Mark and his gospel. And it starts today. Now, there is something you should know about Mark's gospel. He is in a hurry. His gospel is the shortest of all four gospels. It's only 16 chapters. Mark has given us this most condensed version of the Jesus story, and the pace of the story he's telling moves very quickly. For example, whenever he writes about what Jesus said and did, he, he very frequently interjects a word, and it's immediately. Right? Jesus is always doing something immediately. He went there and then immediately he left and went over there and then immediately he did that and it's all immediate. <laughs> so I want you to listen for that this next year. You'll hear it. There is a sense of urgency permeating the entire gospel. And in fact, Mark is in such a hurry to tell his story that um, he actually leaves out all of our classic Advent and Christmas images, right? In Mark's opinion, there's no time for any of that. There's no time for some long genealogy, complex family trees. There's no time for angels. There's no time for a census or those overcrowded motels in Bethlehem or conveniently empty mangers or sheep. There's no time for bloodthirsty kings and stargazing wise guys. No time for gold and frankincense or any other weird baby gifts. There is just no time for all that. We're in a hurry. Mark is in a hurry. And he just does not have time for baby Jesus. <laughs> He's writing with this urgency, you see, that awareness of the fleetingness of life. Um, and it results in a concise gospel that's stripped of any frills or embellishments. But why? Why is Mark in such a hurry to write his gospel? I promise that it's not that he has anything against babies. It's just that he has this amazing story to tell and not much time to tell it. He has to plunge in right where it really gets going, which is a fully grown Jesus beginning his public ministry. And you know that story, right? God became human, God performed miracles, proclaimed a new kingdom, got killed for it, but didn't stay dead, and neither will we. That's Mark's way of telling it, right? It's, <laughs> it's the kind of story you can't help but tell, and it really ought to be written down. And Mark probably thought that if he didn't write that story down right away, he might never get the chance. Why did he think that? Well, he tells us why in those verses that Deacon Valerie just read in chapter 13. And this scene from, from Mark's gospel takes place in a cemetery. As we already established, cemeteries can make you aware of the fleetingness of life, right? And, and so Mark tells us how Jesus starts talking about, you know, in, in the cemetery, starts talking about the Son of Man coming in clouds and, when he, and keeping awake because the Son of Man is coming. And when he's, he's telling this, he's on the Mount of Olives, 
which is a Jewish cemetery in Jerusalem. In the book of Zechariah, this Mount of Olives is identified as the place from which God will begin to redeem the dead at the end of days. And so that setting all of a sudden, oh, clues us in, helps us make sense of this passage and why Mark is sounding the way he's sounding and why Jesus is sounding the way he's sounding. Because in a cemetery, you can't help but ponder the mysteries of life and death, beginnings and endings, and Mark tells us how Jesus stood in that cemetery and spoke of these mysteries. Now, Mark was writing his gospel just a few decades after Jesus' ministry, and like the rest of those early Christians, he was expecting the world to end and Christ to return very, very soon. And it looked like it was going to happen any day now, right? The world was in chaos They were surrounded by war and Christians were being persecuted. The end of the world didn't actually seem that scary. It was actually welcomed. Mark and his fellow Christians are eager for it. They couldn't wait to see the the sun darkened and the stars falling from heaven and the Son of Man coming to gather up his elect, right? After the suffering they had known, those were words of comfort, They fully expected to be in that number, and they were starting to get impatient that it hadn't happened yet. They were waiting for God to come back any day now, Jesus. And that's why Mark explains Jesus in that chapter the way he does, right? And he emphasizes also that God's time is not our own. Even though we say any day now, Jesus... You know, because he knew that that people were restless and starting to question if Jesus was really going to come back. He also has to highlight that there's no way to know when, right? You can't predict this. Um, But about that day or hour, no one knows. What is immediately to God can seem like forever to us. So Mark makes it very clear to his audience that they need to be ready. They need to keep awake and expect Christ. We hear something similar in um, today's Old Testament lesson uh, from the prophet Isaiah. When when Isaiah actually accuses God of hiding from the people of Israel and and begs God to intervene, come down, right? Um, And and so we, we start to get in the mindset of what it was like to wait for this Messiah. Um, Isaiah, Mark, they both help us understand what it was like to be in the world before the story of Jesus, right? We have to try to imagine what it was like to wait for the Messiah, whether the first time or those early days after Jesus the second time when they were waiting again, right? We have to try to understand the conditions that would have led a prophet to cry, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. We have to imagine why Isaiah would have have thought God was hiding, right? Because we have the benefit of knowing the rest of the story. We already know about the angels and the manger and the frankincense. We already know that God became human and performed miracles and proclaimed a new kingdom and got killed for it but didn't stay dead and neither will we. We already know that story. So because we already know that story, our task in Advent is to try to get into the mindset of people for whom that story is just a dream, right? To understand what it was like to wait for Jesus then, because we're actually still waiting for him now. It may be that the only predictable thing about life is that it is fleeting. But thanks to the coming of Christ, which we eagerly await in this season of Advent, we have every good reason to trust that life does not end at the cemetery gate, but rather ends and begins again in the everlasting arms of our Savior for whom we now wait. So keep awake. Amen.